You are listening to The Art of Sales. Everyone sells every day. And this is your source for conversational, real-world sales and prospecting methods that you are comfortable using and that get results. You'll help people buy instead of pushing them into being sold. Here's your host, Art Subcheck. Hey, everybody, and welcome. We are in for a special treat today because our guest is going to give us the sales truth. Over the past few years, somehow there has been an inordinate amount of nonsense that has creeped up and been spread as it relates to sales and how to sell and how to prospect, so much so that many people have accepted some of these things as the norm. And what has really happened, though, is that it was to the detriment of the salespeople and organizations themselves, meaning lack of results and poor morale in the process. Well, today's guest has stepped up and called BS on most of this nonsense in his brand new book, and we're going to talk specifics and what you really should be doing to be successful in sales and prospecting. Mike Weinberg is a consultant, a coach, a speaker, and best-selling author of two Amazon number one bestsellers, New Sales Simplified and Sales Management Simplified. Mike's passion is helping salespeople and sales teams win more new sales. He's spoken and consulted on five continents in the past year alone. He's known for his calling it like he sees it approach and for telling the blunt truth about sales. His new book, published by Harper Collins Leadership, is Sales Truth, Debunk the Myths, Apply Powerful Principles, and Win More New Sales. Mike, welcome. Art, thank you for having me here. This is I great. So, I'm so excited about your topic today because when, when I got your advanced copy, I read this and I was pretty much going to, to skim it, but I, I pretty much read it in one sitting. It was, it was that good. Well, you are, you, how do I say this? I've been a fan of yours for decades and, uh, you know, your endorsement for my first book meant a ton. And, uh, I knew when I shared sales truth with you that it would kind of light you up a little bit. So I just want to thank you for the support and your endorsement. And I can't wait to have this conversation because I think, as you said in the opening, there's a lot of BS out there and I think we need to unpack it. All right. Well, let's do it. And uh, thank you for your comments. And and I've been a big fan ever since you have burst out onto the public scene. I remember when you first contacted me, uh, just for everybody out there, I get a lot of requests to review books. And uh, many of them are just not appropriate. It's just not for what it, it's not for my audience. And I got yours and I thought, OK, well, we'll see what this is all about. And as I went through it, I'm thinking, man, this is really, really good stuff. And uh, so I was happy to give you that endorsement. And, and I know that you owe all of your uh, success to, to me. Um. <laughs> I'd rather give it to you. You know, Anthony Anarino, who wrote the forward, he takes the credit for it every day. So I'm going to give you I'm going to give you the credit instead of him. Uh, so new new sales simplify. That was a great book. That's not the one we're going to be talking about today. Uh, but before we get into today's discussion of the book, tell us a little bit about what you were doing before before your first book and what prompted you to write that book and then become a consultant and a coach. Yeah, you know, Art, I was a top sales guy in multiple companies. I was number one producer in, in three different organizations. And uh, then I had a short stint in coaching and consulting, but I had never been an executive or a manager. So I went back and I spent about six years leading sales organizations. And I learned how hard it was to be a frontline sales manager and then a, a senior sales executive. And I, I honestly craved the days of uh, being able to truly help salespeople sell more. And that's when about eight years ago, I launched back out on my own as a coach and consultant. And uh, I wasn't, you know, planning on writing this book at the time that I, I received some contact from publishers. I, I knew I'd have a book, but I, I was I was blogging and starting to get a little following uh, online. And uh, a couple publishers contacted me and said, hey, you can write. You've got an interesting contrarian point of view and you're a consultant. Why don't you do a book proposal? And that's what led to New Sales Simplified. And honestly, I, I never expected, and I can tell you the publisher didn't expect uh, it to turn into what it's become. So that, that's really what put me on the path. And my passion is helping salespeople and sales teams win more new sales. And that seems to be an area of great controversy and where everybody wants help. So 
Uh, lots, lots going on in my world. Very, very busy running around helping sales teams. Well, that's great. And New Sales Simplified is common sense, and it's something that people can read and take a look at and say, "Wow, I." I can do this. And and I know that's part of the reason why you've been so successful. It's just not you know, pie in the sky in theory. And and it's it's something that really anybody out there can can implement. So let's fast forward and tell us what inspired you to write a book about sales truth. Yeah, I, I, it's really interesting. It's basically two things. It's what I was seeing with my own eyes. It's what I was seeing online. Uh, lots of very popular articles, particularly on LinkedIn, written by people who are supposed experts with big followings. And I was comparing and contrasting what these people were saying had to happen in sales and their, their, their mantra that everything in sales has changed and that nothing that used to work still works. And I was comparing that nonsense, very popular nonsense, with what I was seeing in the very eclectic mix of clients that I have from big defense to big data to big distribution, the heavy equipment and dealerships and, and nothing uh, that I was seeing look like what people were writing about online. And I said, someone has to tell the truth. And I really had, I had two motivations. And that's really the two parts of the book. The first part is me telling the truth about the experts and the, and the garbage that passes for sales advice today. The stuff that you said needed a blowtorch taken to it. And I thank you for how you frame that. <laughs> and then the second part of the book is really the straight truth about what I'm seeing what really works today to win more new sales, to become a master opportunity creator? So you're driving sales process, not just living in reactive mode and chasing opportunities when they're handed to you or someone serves up a warm lead. So that was really the motivation. I was, I was angry and I was also concerned uh, by the level of, of dangerous nonsense being preached and, and passed off as sales advice and people claiming, well, it must be accurate because look at all the people that like my articles. So I, I felt like I was in a position um, based on my following and, and the places that I play uh, in the sales industry to take a few shots at, at the nonsense and also share what I am seeing that's driving a successful new business development. That's interesting. I want to explore that a little bit more because I, I was seeing the same thing. And many times I would just shake my head and think, I'm not going to go roll in the mud with these people. And and it was just absurd. Some of the things that you would read uh, as far as what doesn't work. I mean, uh, prospecting doesn't work. And it, like you said, everything's changed. I mean, you may as well tell me that electricity doesn't work because if, <laughs> if, if somebody's doing it, I, I, I would assume that means that it does work. So I, I love how you called it in your book, the fads, flavors of the day and bad wet bandwagon jumpers. Tell us a little bit more about that and let's expose some of these things. Yeah, it's it's somewhat amusing. Um, I, you know, I, I wrote in my sales management book that, that sales managers all have FOMO, right? Where they all have this fear of missing out and they're always trying to try the latest trick or tool. And, you know, they spend way too much time searching for that, you know, the, the magic bullet that's going to fix all their sales problems. Well, you know whose FOMO is worse than the sales leaders? It's actually sales improvement experts. And I, I will tell you, and you and I have, have chuckled about this, it's interesting to watch some of the folks in our industry year after year after year, they change their tagline. You know, they go, well, last year I was a social selling expert. Now I do digital sales transformation. And then all of a sudden now account-based selling, account-based everything became the rage. So now that's their expertise. So I think what's happened is we've got a lot of people hungry for business and who enjoy a following online where, you know, they, the arbiter of truths and their opinion is likes and following, not necessarily sales effectiveness or what works. So we have, it's very easy. You know, there's no barrier to entry in the thought leader world, right? You need access to a keyboard and a LinkedIn profile and you could call yourself a sales expert. And I think, I think partly because a lot of what is being preached sounds so good, too good to be true, that it tickles the ears of the typical gullible salesperson or distracted or weak sales leader. And they fall for these things that say, you know, you can lose weight by eating all you want and not exercising, right? Eat all the carbs you want, you'll be fine. Well, that's that doesn't work. Just like you and I know that, you know, when you're talking about developing new business and, and creating new opportunities, prospecting is a big part of it. And we all know the phone 
has been and still is and probably for a very long time will be a critical weapon to start a new sales opportunity. But when 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 the when the guys with the loud voices come on telling you no 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 everything's changed the phone is dead it's fruitless to pr- pursue prospects you're from the dark ages stop that if you write articles and you tweet and you hang out in LinkedIn groups and you and you follow the right people when they get fifty seven percent through the buying process they're going to call you and that's that's the myth right I had I had somebody that has been a follower for years. And they emailed me and told me that they started following one of these uh, don't cold call experts out there and, and followed the, the social media process. And I'm not even sure what all was involved. I don't know, uh, door hangers and carrier pinches or something. And uh, he said, I pretty much went bankrupt during that year. And he said, I had to go back to just what you teach. And that is simply picking up the phone and, and talking to humans. Mm. All right, you know what's weird? And this is where I want to be careful that people don't accuse us of being hypocrites because you and I both play online. We both have significant followings, right? People read our content. I'm not anti-social. I'm not anti-social media, anti-social selling. Um, I think we should use every means that's ethical and appropriate necessary to get a prospect's attention and secure that early stage meeting we're looking for. Um, I'm not against using all those tools. I love, I love Twitter. I love LinkedIn. I love putting out content, but that doesn't mean you should abandon the traditional tool that we know works. It's a great supplement, but it's not a replacement for the, for the traditional methods. And what, and so when I, when I go nuts in the book and I told some crazy stories, I mean, I made fun of a guy who is the chief sales officer of a company who calls their founders, the foremost social selling experts on planet earth. And they're the company you go to for digital sales transformation, whatever the heck that means. Right. And this chief sales officer basically said, and he, he used this, this picture of Kylie Jenner on the cover of Forbes magazine. And he held her out as the example to sales leaders saying, listen, sales leaders, she's about to pass a billion dollars in net worth, right? Can't you see that social selling leads to real sales? And then he went on to throw the snarky comment and say, you know, she didn't, Kylie Jenner didn't cold call her way to a billion dollars in net worth. And I'm thinking, holy desperation, Batman, how cheap, how disingenuous, how foolish, like this is the message of the social selling experts, like the company in digital sales transformation, that Kylie Jenner is the role model for the typical business to business salesperson, like taking selfies of herself half naked. Like what's the application there for my defense contractor salesperson, the pharmaceutical sales rep, the person selling selling 3M abrasives for a distributorship or the guys at my John Deere dealer or the typical mortgage broker? Like tell me, tell me how Kylie Jenner is the example. So that's why I freaked out and and I I felt like I had to write some of this stuff because it's foolish. And anyone with a shred of common sense who has any sales success at all knows that that's stupid. So if those are the people telling you don't pick up the phone, you know, copy Kylie Jenner, that my anger isn't towards uh, social selling. I use it. My anger is to the morons that are saying this dangerous nonsense that keeps people from picking up the phone. Because you and I see this, right? We have clients and their salespeople are call reluctant for lots of reasons, mostly because they haven't read smart calling or listened to your coaching on how to, how to improve on the telephone. And they finally get up the nerve to make a phone call to do, to do their thing. And then they, they make the mistake of getting on LinkedIn and they see one of these articles written by these charlatans with an agenda telling them, come on, you're an idiot. People are going to make fun of you. What are you a dinosaur using the telephone that they plugged into the wall? Are you kidding me? And then they don't do it. And then they hope, they hope some SDR is going to serve them up a lead or their inbound marketing efforts going to, you know, more people are going to just keep raising their hand and saying, Hey, give me a demo. And it's, that's the situation that, that we find ourselves in today. I'm, I'm sorry. I got stuck because I, I was thinking about myself sending out half naked pictures and I, I'm not, not sure that would work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> me, me neither. And, and it, it also reminds me of something, of a story that I quite often tell in, in workshops, and that is every once in a while, somebody will ask me, they'll say, what, what do you have that's new or advanced? And my typical response is, do you have the basics mastered? 
because if you want to go right to what's new and what's advanced without having the basics mastered, you're going to fall down horribly. I yeah. wouldn't go to the golf pro at my club and say, you know, um, my, my game really needs work, but I want to skip right to the trick shots. <laughs> Art, I freaking love you. Yes. <laughs> You, I, I have the same thing where a salesperson, they want some trick on, well, how do you sell to a committee of women on a Tuesday? Like, I need a closing technique. And I'm like, um, let me ask you a question. Can you show me your target prospect list? And can I hear your messaging? And is it self-focused garbage or is it others centered and outcome and issue based on how you help clients? And let me hear you on the phone and show me your outline for a discovery meeting. And do you have real questions that you ask? And hey, why don't you grab your calendar and show me how much time you spend selling? And like, please don't ask me trick questions and for advanced techniques, like, because you and I both know you can solve about 90% of the sales problems in this world with those five or six questions I just asked, right? Like people aren't doing the basics. And that's what's so interesting. And that my favorite chapter in the book, Art, is, is chapter 15. And it's where I profile two of the very best salespeople I've ever seen. And neither of them are my clients. I've never trained any of them. This is just my pure observation. Uh, two totally different people, totally different industries, different personalities, but top of their game, best in the country at what they do. Literally, like documented best in the country at what they sell. And and what I what my hope is and the takeaway from that chapter is that as the average salesperson reads what these extreme, extremely uh, successful, super high productive sellers do, is that they're strangely encouraged that they're extraordinary salespeople but they don't have extraordinary processes. These guys have mastered the basics. They know their business. They know their customers. They understand the competition. They work their butt off. They prepare like crazy. They do so much work backstage prepping and researching and practicing to get ready for when they're front, front stage with, with a prospect. Like all the stuff they do, we could emulate, but it, it requires work. And that's what people don't want to do, which is why I think some of the social selling nonsense and the inbound only people and all the, the you know, whatever the new bandwagon is going to be tomorrow, because there's going to be a new one. And then all the sales improvement experts are going to jump on that bandwagon. Uh, I think the reason they, they get so popular is because we want what they're preaching to be true. We would love to lose weight eating all the calories and carbs we want. We would love to fill our pipeline sitting on our ass uh, tweeting and putting out extremely uh, provocative blog posts. But the truth is that doesn't work. And the reason that most salespeople are opportunity starved is because they don't work the top of the funnel and they listen to this nonsense and they haven't mastered the basics that you and I teach every day. And we have all the proof in the world from real clients in real companies that the things we've been teaching and will continue to teach work very well when implemented. It's it's interesting because I, you're applying this to other disciplines, which is exactly true, such as losing weight or becoming better at anything. People are inherently lazy and I put myself in that category. We all want the easy button. And instead of putting in the work people will gravitate towards what somebody is promising with the rainbows and the unicorns. And they're thinking, well, maybe that's it. And as we mentioned right at the beginning, it's going to be to the detriment of their success because we know those things alone don't work. And you're right. I, I use social media and marketing extensively. And most of these things, let's face it, are marketing. And however, I tried to pay my mortgage with likes the other day and the banker just laughed at me. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> our, our mutual friend, Mark Hunter, says it all the time. He says... You can't take likes to the bank salespeople. That's not going to help you. I'm with you. Uh, I'm with you. So, so, and we, we use the term social selling. I remember when I first heard that, I, I mean, I'm still a little bit perplexed by just the term social selling because isn't all good selling social? Mm, that's so good. Yeah, I think, I think it was catchy and it was a cool phrase. And, and when social media was new, it gave some people something to grab onto you know, my, my confusion, and I don't say this in a mean spirited way, but I'm, I'm just watching the industry. And I think for the most part, the social selling experts are, are about gone and the fad is, is, has faded. And, and the guy who calls himself the creator of social selling, and that's in his LinkedIn profile. And he, he takes credit for that. He, he's changed jobs about four times in the last four years. And the woman who was the queen of social selling and called her firm hashtag social selling, she's not teaching social selling anymore. 
And I don't, I don't know that you need any more evidence than that, right? Even, even one of the largest social selling training firms run by really good people. I mean, a classy, high integrity people, you know, in their own advertisement for a job to work for this social selling training company in the ad, they made it really clear in the job description that the salesperson who would come work for them would need to deploy outbound prospecting techniques. Let me, let me say that again. The, one of the largest social selling training companies in their own ad for a sales job said, hey, if you come work here to sell our social selling training, you're going to use outbound prospecting because we need, we need to fill the funnel. Like there's nothing, what else can I possibly say, right? Like, duh. And so, 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 so use all methods available, but don't listen to the people that are poo-pooing uh, traditional methods because they work really darn well, especially when implemented well. The the human brain has not really changed a whole lot over the past, what, I don't know, a couple thousand years, probably much more than that. And people still, people talking to people is still the most effective way to communicate and, and persuade. And like, like you said, all these other methods are good complements to warming people up, to building a relationship in advance to easing into a conversation, but ultimately all of that should be geared towards taking that conversation offline and doing it either over the phone or face-to-face. -face. Absolutely. Yeah, nothing has changed in that, in that sense. So, so let's blow up some of these uh, some of these myths that you really skewer in the book. So we so we talked about social selling. What what are some? And I think you also mentioned inbound only. What are, what are some of the other things that you talk about? Oh, uh, account based selling is a new thing. Uh, that's the last couple of years. Account based marketing ABM or account based selling ABS. Um, honestly, I'm not really sure what it means. Uh, I think it's a label that some sales experts created to say, hey, we should align our our sales efforts and our messaging and our processes to our customers' processes. We should align with the accounts. I'm like, well, that's not exactly novel, um, but it's a hot phrase for the last year. So everyone wants to fall under the banner of a account based selling. I'm, I'm not sure why. Um, you know, sales enablement, I don't know what your take on sales enablement is. Um, I have lots of clients that say they're sales enablement people at their companies. And um, I tell you what's interesting is when you, when you ask someone, well, what is sales enablement? If you ask 10 people, you get about a dozen answers and there's not a lot of agreement there. And I think it's become really trendy to talk about enabling salespeople as opposed to just coaching them or holding them accountable. Um, so that that's a, a source of great confusion to me. Um, I don't pretend to understand artificial intelligence. I, I get that there's new technology. I get that I use Amazon and it has lots of great predictive algorithms. Um, I get that that a lot of restaurants have put in kiosks to order. So they've removed the counter people in low value transactions, but I don't see professional sellers going away. I mean, I'm curious for your take on AI. Like I, I, I read some stuff, our friend, Anthony Anarino, he says, you know, the, the call, he calls them the chicken little crowd. The sky is falling. The sky is falling in a few years. There won't be any salespeople because we're all going to be replaced by artificial intelligence bots. And I'm like, mm, not so much. Show me the salesperson who can articulate value, who does great discovery, who build consensus, who can show uh, a customer how to create a great outcome. And I, I think there's a great demand for people like that. Um, what, what's your take on AI? Well, I think AI is. is phenomenal and it has its place, but its place is not in one-to-one -one human interaction that requires somebody to be able to improvise, answer questions, and base their persuasive next statements on what the other person just told you in, mm -hmm. in a sales situation. Uh, and that also means not automating parts of the sales process or the engagement process. And it kills me anytime I get some LinkedIn connections and I can obviously see that this was this was automated simply because somebody said they they uh, reviewed my LinkedIn profile, which clearly they did not. And what they did was they they hit a button and it activated some software. And whatever AI is involved there is is clearly not working and, and turning people off. So it definitely has its place. And and I'm a little bit of a dinosaur. And uh, I, I think self driving cars maybe at some point may work, but. Um, I, I don't, I certainly don't want to walk in front of one. So, <laughs> so when you, so when you read an article that says in three years, 50% of the salespeople won't have jobs because of artificial intelligence, you would say that's a false statement. Yes. 
I, I would say that's a false statement. And here's the thing, and you talk about this in your book, if you can use numbers to prove or disprove any any argument. And when we're talking about sales, I mean, are, are we talking about the, the salesperson at Albertsons, if you want to call them a salesperson? Or are we talking about the salesperson for Google or, or Microsoft? So maybe some of the the lower level sales functions will be eliminated which they already are i mean look at self checkout and and some maybe some inbound functions are also being uh handled by the robots which you know, personally in some cases i like to use them in other cases i don't i want to talk to a human so but but yeah to respond to your point there that the people normally when you hear some outrageous claim let's face it and I think you talk about this in the book, it's normally being made by somebody trying to sell their stuff. And it, it can be challenged with common sense and facts. Absolutely. I'm totally, totally with you on that. So let's, let's get to the truth. Tell us what still works. And I know we're on the same page here and what salespeople should be doing both in prospecting and in working with customers. I guess that would be account based. Uh, well, anyway. Yeah. I, <laughs> what works is having a strategic list of target accounts that look, smell, and feel like your best customers or clients. What works is carving out time on your calendar to actually sell. One of the great sins in sales today is how little time most full-time salespeople spend selling. They're working, but they're not proactively selling. I've got clients. I see salespeople working 50 60 hours a week. They have become inbox jockeys and glorified customer service reps, uh, CSRs with a car. Um, they do corporate admin. Uh, they, they do accounting. I got one client that took them two days a month for the salespeople to prepare and send out invoices. Could you imagine that? A struggling sales team spending basically 10% of the work days in a month preparing invoices. I mean, talk about uh, a loss of productivity. So so strategic targeting of the right accounts, owning your calendar and being really selfish and carving out time to work all aspects of the funnel. Um, one of my great frustrations is how most salespeople, A, default to service mode, and then B, once they finally have time to do selling, they always start to try to close their hottest deals first, right? They're, they're drawn, and I get why, and they want to close the deal. They want to make the money. They want to, they want to push it over the finish line, but they, they default to, to always going after that warm deal. And then with whatever little bit of time or energy they have left, they'll, they'll kind of play with their active opportunities and try to move something forward in the pipeline. And when they do that, the top, the part of the, the funnel that gets ignored is the top. It's the cold leads. It's the targeted accounts that you have to proactively work to create opportunities. So you're driving the sales process. So, so I'm really seeing people who are most successful, honestly, are most selfish with their selling time. Yes, they're laser focused on, on their list and who to go after. And it's not nebulous. They have great clarity about whose business they want. They own their calendar. They prioritize prospecting and top of the funnel work to do that work first. It's not an afterthought. It's not a hobby. They prioritize. And then, and then the other things I see really working are, are messaging. Um, it's really honing in what I call your sales story. It's your value prop. I, sometimes I call it a power statement, the pitch. And it's really understanding that you need a collection of compelling client issue and client outcome talking points. So you're leading your messaging with things that matter to the prospect. They have pains. They'd love them removed. They have problems they want solved. They have opportunities they, they want to capture and they're looking for better results. And when your messaging is about how you help people and why other people turn to you and the, and the outcomes you create, the whole dynamic and the sales process and the, and the sales dynamic changes because instead of getting that resistance from the buyer, oh, you're pitching, you're pushing, it's about you, your company, your solution, how great you are. When you lead with, hey, I'm, here's how I'm helping other people. Here's some of the results they're achieving. I'd love to visit with you. Not only do their defenses come down, but they kind of give you that head nod like, okay, that's really intriguing. You help people like me? Tell me more. And honestly, Art, if someone put a gun in my head and said, hey, what are you really seeing that works? How do I increase sales? I would start with those three things. Make a great list, carve out more time to sell, and fix your messaging. And then from there, and I'll, I'll pause here because we're going to get back to get to your favorite topic. 
uh, then you apply all that to the telephone and initiating contact with people. And that's what I see working. And whether it's like guys with PhDs in, in engineering at my defense contractor, or it's folks that sell Mack trucks or heavy equipment or distributorships, the salespeople that put those pieces together are uh, thriving from having full funnels and, and healthy pipelines. And they're always creating opportunities. They're not sitting on their butt waiting to chase one. I, of course, agree with you a, a thousand percent, if that is possible, if there is a thousand percent. And it, it's interesting going back to what you said before about people not selling. I'll always ask potential clients, where do you feel you need the most work? And sometimes I get the answer, well, my people are just not on the phone. And, and then I'm thinking, well, who's running this operation? <laughs> <laughs> and I know you go into that. <laughs> yeah, we can probably have a whole show just on your sales management simplified. So, so there's a big issue there. And of course, the, the messaging. I, I mean, I built my entire career on, on messaging. And it's, it's even more essential today because in the environment we're in with people being hit with probably about a thousand messages I saw in, in some article a day, we all have become professional ignorers. We have to ignore by necessity most messages that we're hit with every day, which means that as salespeople, we've got to be that much better to have a message that resonates with the person at the other end of the line. So again, couldn't agree with you more. And then the other part that I want to add to that is the best salespeople I see work the process. They understand the process. And when you work the process consistently, which is putting the activity in the right way, the quality activity, the results come out the other end. The great football coach, Tom Osborne said, it wasn't about the wins and the losses. It was always about the process. And he won several national championships that way. Boy, I, I love everything you said there. And I want to go back. Uh, professional ignorer. Wow, that's good. <laughs> that, that's tweetable. Let me, let, me, let me add something on process too. Um, you're talking about you know owning the process, especially on the front end of the sales cycle. One of the things that I'm seeing that's incredibly frustrating is the rise of procurement and the rise of companies, uh, the client side, really trying to dictate uh, your sales process with their buying process. And I'm seeing a lot of weak or uncoached salespeople continuing to acquiesce to exactly what buyers are asking them to do. And it's not working out well for them. They end up falling into what I call the procurement pit and they get viewed as just a vendor and they're getting commoditized along with their competitors where they're not setting themselves apart. And I, I think a lot of that is because we have salespeople that are, that are either wimpy or they're just not aware that you don't have to do everything a customer tells you to do, that you don't win deals by scoring obedience points. And, and what I've been telling my, my salespeople is that I have two big motivations when I sell. One is I want to win. And two is I am compelled to create the best possible outcome and the most value for the client. And I want to follow a process that gives me A, the best chance of winning, and B, that's going to produce the best outcome for the client. And when their silly process or their procurement weenie or something that they've set up for how they're going to buy this thing that you sell doesn't align with those two objectives of giving you a good chance of winning or getting them the best solution, then you have to put your foot down and push back and go, wait a second, just because you're telling me to do that, it doesn't mean I'm going to get you the best solution that way. And I am just perpetually frustrated at the amount of wimpy salespeople. When I, when I put some excerpts from that chapter on LinkedIn, you should have seen the cowering that I heard back, I can't do that. What do you, I'm going to get in trouble and I, I need them to like me. And well, it was just crazy. The lack of understanding that as a salesperson, you actually have authority and you have some rights and you don't have to do everything the, the client asks you to do. And I tell some stories in there from my own business, but also from some of my smaller clients where they have done an incredible job um, where they, they're the little David selling again you know, to this giant Goliath client. And they've pushed back against procurement and process and they're winning deals and they're and they're they're preventing things from going to RFP and they're getting meetings when people tell them, no, our process is not going to we're not going to meet with you. You're going to do this first. And I'm just I just wanted the, the, the salespeople listening to this to hear you have rights and you can own your process and acquiescing uh, all the time and doing what they tell you probably isn't going to win you more deals just because you think you're more likable that way. So I just wanted to I wanted to put that out there. I love what you said. 
I hadn't heard that before. Procurement weenie. I, I'm pretty sure that ruined any chance you have at speaking before the uh, Procurement Professionals Association. <laughs> yeah, I'm not interested in befriending those people. Um, in fact, in yeah. that article I put on LinkedIn, one of those procurement type people actually made a comment and says, I don't understand. And the best deals happen when there's collaboration and you need to follow our process. We're here to help our clients. Well, I'll tell you what I've learned. In a lot of cases, procurement people are not helping their client, which is the business people in their company. They're actually working against the objectives of the business people because they have different motivations and they're not aligned at all. I'm not interested in collaborating with procurement. I want to defeat them at every turn. And that's why I tell those stories in that chapter in the book. I'm telling them to pound sand. And the way you do that is you bring a ton of value and you get really close to the business people that need what you sell. And you get aligned with them and their objectives and you help lead them down the path so that they can acquire what you're selling. And sometimes that means they have to go against their company's stated processes. But let me tell you something. That's not as impossible as so many people think it is. I'm, I'm doing it every day and so are my clients. Well, I agree with you totally. And the, the problem is, is that procurement's objective is not to get the, uh, the best value for the company. It's to get the cheapest price for the company. And as I always tell my clients and the sales reps is that you've got to change your mindset and we got to talk to the people who own the problem and who are going to benefit from the result. And that's almost never procurement. Bingo. That's powerful art. I love the way you phrase that. Bingo. Mike, we could talk for hours here and I do want to have you back on so that we can go deeper in several of these, but let's, let's end up with some final advice that you have for professional salespeople today. Keep it simple. Stay focused. And please hear me on this. Everything has not changed in sales. And anytime you read an article or you hear someone say, well, it doesn't work anymore. Everything in sales has changed. You're not hearing the truth. And I can tell you that I could take you into that crazy eclectic mix of clients I have and show you the top one or two salespeople in every company and the best practices they're deploying today. Their words, their approaches, their mindset, their techniques, their sales process, how they run sales calls, how they use the phone. Those are the same best practices being executed the same way top producers were doing it five years ago and 10 years ago and oftentimes 20 years ago. So my advice is don't be looking for the silver bullet. It's not out there. There are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. Be ready to do the work. If you master the fundamentals, you can master selling and be incredibly successful. So true. I would encourage people to go back, rewind that, play it several times. All right, everybody, followers of the show, you know what time it is. Your attitude will be I in every way you'll never feel what they say. The art of the sales quote of the day. That's right. One of our regular features on the show, Mike, is the quote of the day. And I know you've been inspired by uh, many people in uh, your sales and, and coaching career. So what's one of your favorite quotes? And tell us why it's important to you. Wow. I, I love this. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually quote my dad, who was a big time sales executive. And part of the reason I said I'm never going to go into sales. <laughs> <laughs> That didn't work out that way. So I ended up in sales and uh, I was moving out to St. Louis. This is probably 27 years ago. And my dad sat me down for the talk. And he said, Mike, here's the deal. You need to know this going into sales. Your number one goal is to make the customer as successful as possible. And when you're selling, if your motivation is to help the customer win, you will always win in sales. And that's as pure and beautiful and authentic Man, is when he told me that 27 years ago. When, when we're motivated to truly help the customer, everything changes. You have their best interest at heart. They can smell that on you. You come across authentic and credible and likable and trustworthy. And it means that you sell with integrity. So that's, that's the quote from my dad. Well, what a great quote. And you've certainly followed that. And, and it was true. And so how did you decide to get into sales when you, when you felt you didn't want to get into sales? I never wanted to be in sales. I thought that's not for me. There were a couple of things that conspired. I was working in this crazy job as the assistant to the CEO and owner of Slim Fast Foods when it was this super fast growing company in the early 90s and flying around in a private jet with the owner of the company and making sales calls, basically. I mean, literally, I was on this Gulfstream jet with the vice president of sales 
and the owner of the company, and we'd be flying into Walmart or Target or some massive retailer that would, you know, stock SlimFast. And we'd land and the local sales manager would meet us at the private airport and we'd get in a car and go make a sales call. And watching the CEO sell convinced me that sales isn't what I thought it was. And it wasn't about pushing stuff on someone that doesn't want it. It's about being a consultant and being trustworthy and really understanding your customer's business so you can make good recommendations and help them. And it's about sitting at the table with them, not pitching at them. And, and all of that opened my eyes to, ooh, this is different. And I saw salespeople made money and they had fun and they had freedom and, and they were judged on, on meritocracy, not politics. My favorite thing about sales, it's about results. It's not about politics. It's not about how hard you work. Go produce. You go produce, blow your number out. I'm never going to ask any other questions. So that's what kind of got me going down the path. And that's what moved me out of New York to St. Louis. And uh, I quickly got out of selling to retailers and found that my real sweet spot was business to business sales, kind of typical traditional prospecting and hunting for new accounts and clients. And that's what put me on the path to where we are sitting here today talking about it. Well, I'm so glad you listened to the advice of your dad and your mentor at, at SlimFast and actually glad that, that you got out of selling for somebody else because you're touching so many lives and making the sales profession so much better today. Mike, thank you so much for being on. How can people get in contact with you? How can they get the book? Well, actually, we'll put the link for the book up on the show notes page, but you can, you can tell them here as well. And uh, anything else that you'd like to share? Well, first, I just want to say thank you. You are truly one of my longtime heroes in the sales improvement industry. I was following you before I had any inkling that that I would be doing this. So it's really a treat to talk with you. And you know, I like to take credit for selling as many copies of your book, Smart Calling, as anyone else in this industry, because I tell everyone they need that book. So thank you for having me. Um, you can follow me online at Mike underscore Weinberg, W-E-I-N-B-E-R-G on Twitter and Instagram, Mike underscore Weinberg. And my, my website and blog is MikeWeinberg.com. Fantastic. And uh, people can get the book at Amazon and it, it is doing great. And we'll also have the link to that book in the show notes. And I would encourage you go out get that one. And and actually, if you buy it on Amazon, they'll probably uh, have, they'll probably suggest through artificial intelligence, all, <laughs> both of Mike's other books. So, so get those as well. Mike, thank you again so much for being on with us today. We'll do this again. And uh, everybody else, thank you for sharing your investing, your valuable time with us today. Until next time, go out and make it your best sales day ever. I'm Art Subcheck.